Wanting two things at the same time is the cause of misery by Yuji Krishnamurti. Hello everyone, this is Arthur PB Flower. Welcome to my channel and Happy New Year. I am a published author of a trilogy called All Kal Nan. It is available on Amazon.com if you want to go ahead and check it out. It is a science fiction fantasy romance novel. Spans across many genres. Well, on this channel, I talk about life as a human's experience. It is not a self-help or guide towards enlightenment or realization by any means. Uh, I am a fan of Yuji Krishnamurti and my discussion topics are meant to steer us back to what we are doing as humans, living our life, back to our body. Because Yuji said body is eternal. Everything else is just thoughts and ideas. And I'm trying to do it in a balanced way. You know, live this life. Because you cannot be for one and not against the other. Unless you know both perspectives, you're not balanced. Which is difficult, actually. Very difficult. But that is why... I'm here. I try and discuss everything that us humans go through every day and try and find balance in this otherwise divided, conflicted, and miserable world. Is the world miserable? Well, anyway, it is what our today's topic is, actually. Um, wanting two things at the same time is cause of misery, is what Yuji Krishnamurti said. And I was discussing this misery because, you know, misery is like established part of our human life. And I was discussing this with my husband and he said that um, time is what is the cause of misery. So now I'm questioning to find out how these two can be joined together. You know what Yuji said and what my husband said. Now my husband also said that only when you have time to reflect is when there is misery because we invent it. <clears throat> and reflecting is what? Comparison. And comparison can only exist when there are two things. So anyway, um, you know, all these uh, religious establishments they thrive on misery of others, if you look at it. There, if there was no misery, religious, religion, these religious institutes, they will all become useless. Because religion promises freeing, or freedom from misery. Also, all these world gurus, they thrive on misery of others. Because only a miserable person goes looking for a guru. If everyone is content and busy with their lives, they will not need gurus. Heck, even the society is doing that. Law does that. The government does that. Everyone is promising you freedom from misery. But how do you realize you are miserable? How did you establish that? Well, when you sat back and reflected, when you had the time to do so. And if everyone was just busy surviving, there would be no room for thoughts and ideas. And I mean surviving in the wild. But instead we are busy surviving in the society, which itself is an idea. Society is an idea, it's artificial, it doesn't exist, it's not tangible. So we cannot get out of the thoughts, ideas and knowledge loop if we are living in the society. We are inadvertently a part of it at all times. And the society instills comparison. This is how it encourages everyone to run faster, beat each other in this artificial world to get ahead, but still stay in the artificial world. However, this comparison tells you how much you don't have how much more you need to keep working for. 
A satisfied person is branded as someone with no ambition, a loser. And we are also told to look up, not look down, right? We need to look up and compare. If we look down and compare, <clears throat> then we are not going to run. We are just going to go and perhaps reform. And there are reformers. So <clears throat> why do we look up? Because then we can keep the comparison going and keep running. Now, here's an example from my life, my personal life. I live in the U.S. and my daughter goes to school here. And in the grade schools, there is this program called the advanced program, where if your child is at a certain level, above a certain level, they can be enrolled into that. And so it is basically a classic example of comparative chronology. And uh, up until a few years ago, I used to fill the form for my daughter for admission every year. Um, it, here in US, I have to fill that form every year. I don't know how it is in other parts of the world, but anyway, so uh, my husband does that now for my daughter. But when I was when I used to do that, and when my when my daughter transitioned from elementary to middle school, uh, which was in grade sixth, she. I did not elect her for this advanced program. I did not enroll her in it. Although she was brilliant in maths and I could have enrolled her in the AP program for math and perhaps science too because she is good at studies. Um, she always scores like 95 or above, sometimes perfect score of 100. So anyway, my husband asked me why I did not choose AP for her because you know every Indian kid was in AP program here or there in Dallas. It, this was in Dallas. And so I told my husband, well, because this way she will be best in her class. That was my logic. And my husband said, well, colleges pick kids who tried to be best of the best and not best of the worst and average. The thing that I pushed my daughter into. So even colleges, they see if you were rat racing constantly in grade school or not. It is highly appreciated if you have already been running your ass off. So anyway, uh, like I said, that was in Dallas schools. Now we are in Tennessee and here she was, um, <clears throat> when, she, when we came here, I think that was in seventh grade, she was automatically put in the higher potential lot because that's how the things are here. They don't wait around for the parent to do that. They determined that she was doing really well above average um, in her class, so they put her in this advanced class. And it is a different thing that she still excels because it comes naturally to her. But what about someone who is um, struggling, the kids that are not advanced? I guess that's okay because there's normal class for them, right? But I told you that every Indian kid was in advanced class in Dallas. And that's how my husband had questioned me because, um, you know, every of my daughter's Indian friends, they were all in advanced class except for her because I didn't put her there. Um, so I have seen that, that here, some of the Indian kids that are not advanced, their parents are like howling at them every day. The stupid comparison is washing off their spirit. It's not like they don't have anything else to offer. They do. They are good at something else. But this comparison is putting them in a situation where they are constantly having to work on themselves, on something that they are not naturally good at. So yes, comparison is misery, right? Root cause of misery. And UG had said that comparison is your misery, holding on to something for permanence. And I have discussed this in elaborate, in great detail in my... Um, permanence podcast. 
So how do you compare? Of course, with knowledge. And I discussed just now that it starts early on from the childhood, from grade school itself. So perhaps knowledge is also misery. You can't be miserable unless you think that there is something better. So this hope of finding something better is misery as well. Let's take uh, an everyday example. Of course, parents would relate better to this, but um, you know, these kids, you know, when they're at um, like toddlers, if they fall down and hurt themselves, they usually don't cry unless someone looks at them, unless someone acknowledges their pain. So if a parent would not look at them, they would not cry. They would just go about and rub themselves and, you know, make themselves feel better. But if a parent goes running to them and says, oh my God, did you get hurt? Or, oh my God, you got hurt. You know, induce this knowledge in them that they got hurt would create the misery and then they start crying. So it's a mental creation. We just put it in their head. And I keep, I've given this example before that, you know, this um, baby rhino, it got in between two adult rhinos fight and then one of the rhino just punctured through the stomach of this baby rhino and it just stood there and bled to its death and the mother also stood in the distance. Nobody, none of the rhinos there were trying to come and say, oh my God, your baby is over there bleeding to death. You know, it was just an event. It happened. Everybody perhaps didn't even acknowledge it. There was no acknowledgement. It was just an event. It happened and the baby just bled to its death. So it's only when we acknowledge, it's only when we compare, it's only when we reflect that the misery comes to exist. And the world is not miserable, like I just said when I started this podcast. The person who says world is miserable is only trying to validate that he is somehow not in that state. He or she. If someone is not miserable, they don't have the time to think or reflect. The ability to retrieve knowledge and compare is true misery. It's knowledge and comparison. The world is not miserable. Like I just gave the example of the rhinoceros, the baby rhino. For us, we think it's miserable because I still get haunted by that image. Because I'm, I begin comparing to my situation me as a mother and my daughter. But it just happened. It's an event. The world is not miserable. There are things going on in there. So anyway, I would also like to rope in reformers here because reformers do that. They constantly compare. And I've done it in some podcasts before where this character, Zenith and Nikla, they were talking about this woman who was battered and she was being tended by the um, paramedics. And Zenith was very sure that this woman is suffering and there's a better life out there for her. And Nikla was disagreeing with her. And um, this is the explanation that Nikla had given to Zenith that you would not know you are lacking unless someone points it out to you show you other options like a child living in poverty never exposed to rich lifestyle nothing to compare with that child could still be genuinely happy until someone some interfering reformer arrives pointing out the misery comparing the child's life to what they themselves are used to 
but that child does not care about luxury. Ignorance is bliss, so let them be. Don't enslave them in your indulgences. So here we see that it is not just comparison, but also the time taken to make one reflect on a given situation. If we are busy with our lives, we wouldn't know. I can give you another example. Like, um, I live in a community where um, there are many people who have maids come in and clean their homes. And here I'm the maid. You're looking at me. I'm the maid in my house. I can't afford a maid that charges $200 for every visit to come and clean the home when I'm fully capable of cleaning my house myself. But there are people who are engaging maid services. And that's great. They can afford it. They can do it. But if I start comparing myself with them, I'm definitely going to be miserable. I'm going to haunt my husband and say, we need, we need to get made. I can't do all this. I, I can't work. I can't clean my home. Well, I bought the home. When I bought the home, I should have known that I can't um, clean it. And if you can't clean it, then buy a smaller home. Or you have that much to spare to bring a maid. You know, work it out. If we keep comparing, there is no solution. You will be miserable. And during that discourse between Zenith and Iklavi, Iklavi had given a solution which is very similar to the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. He had told Zenith that humans should um, <clears throat> have a wholesome learning, free of conditioning, just like Shala so that they can be self-aware, fend for themselves, fight for themselves, not give others the right to decide for them. And Shala is the schooling system on another planet where Iklavi completed his learning from. Um, and it is very, very advanced where there is no comparisons made. It's um, an individual learning system. Anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, it's... it's uh, the solution that he gave was like Bhagavad Gita where, you know, you're responsible for your life. If you compare, you give others the right to tell you if you are miserable or not, if you're happy or not, then that's just what's going to happen. It will always be comparative. And when we, you are in comparison, you can never be happy because you'll either have more or less. And in both the cases, misery sets in. If you have more, you will be burdened with guilt and be miserable why others don't have much. And if you have less, then you will be like, why don't I have more? Maybe I need to work harder. So another example that we can take from our daily lives is, um, again, I'm taking example of a child because, you know, this whole concept of misery sets in us from very early on, from childhood. Because comparison starts right from childhood. So here in US, um, when a child is born, you have to have a pediatrician ready to come and look at the baby as soon as it's born. Uh, the child, um, the pediatrician comes and visits at the hospital where you have given the birth and, you know, they check the child and let you know if they are normal. And every time I <clears throat> took my child to the pediatrician, they would give me this um, brochure where it'll have all the milestones that your child should have reached at that age because that's the guidelines that have been set. That this is normal. Anything above or below is not normal. Even though they, the pediatrician was advocating me that 
oh, every child has a different milestone, but it can't deviate too much. You know? You reach the milestones differently, but you can't deviate too much. If you deviate too much, then you're not normal. And what is this normal? This normal is a pattern of behavior that has been accepted by the society so that you can function in there and listen in and be under control. Because that's what it is. And I don't understand where they draw this line, you know, that, oh, now you're not normal, but here you are normal. Because, you know, when you are, um, because there's above and below average, right? So let's say you're above average, you're like genius or intelligent. Even there, I don't know, I don't know how they draw the line. Because someone who's very, very, or a genius, bordering mere genius, is also crazy. You know, as per the society. Because they are not going to be in control because they have too many thoughts and ideas coming in here that they are processing because their brain is capable of processing more than the others. So I don't know where they draw this line, you know, because this average also keeps changing. So it is, it's just so difficult to achieve that balance, to not compare. But if we seriously, seriously stop comparing ourselves with others and just manage ourselves, our condition, our life, we will we will achieve some sort of balance. If not fully, we'll at least achieve some sort of balance. If we don't set all these goals by comparing ourselves with others or comparing ourselves with our parents or comparing ourselves with our siblings, friends, extended family, you know, we'll be that much happier. Or let's not even use the word happy. Because that's also comparison. How do you determine you're happy when you compare to a sad situation, right? So then you will be balanced. Let's use the word balance because that's what it is. If you don't have comparison, if you're not using all of these accrued knowledge, then you're in balance. And that's what we need. We need to be in balance. Not look for happiness or not look for contentment, enlightenment, not all of this. Enlightenment is is actually knowing more. It's actually chaos. So once we stop comparing ourselves, we will achieve the balance of some sort. Well, thank you for listening in. This is Arthur PB Flower. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>